pre-rendering. It uh, has a virtual GPU, so just another virtual device in QMU, which uses the Guardian and ETSI shader instruction language uh, as part of the new VertIO PGA device. And this way, we basically we have a virtual GPU. We have a guest driver, a Linux guest driver only at the moment, which collects 3D drawing commands and commands stream and resources like shaders and textures. And it passes the commands and the data through to the host GPU. Uh, currently, this is not true. What it says here that it's using EG, EGL and a theorem render node. This is not true for the proof of concept, which we saw. But this is the way it's going to be when we are where we want to. So integrating virtual 3D and SPICE. Um, currently, SPICE is already integrated into QMU's console system, so you can use SPICE as a display protocol without using a special SPICE QXL graphical device. Or you can even use the QXL graphical device to use PMC as a display protocol or a local SDL display. So there is like an abstraction layer that we can SPICE and QXL sort of belong together, but you already have a separation there. Uh, we want to use that and extend it to also the multi hat Currently, the multi hat is sort of a spice specific extension. It goes, doesn't use the console system, it uh, moves around it basically. Uh, besides multi hat support, we'll also be needing a new local UI for people who just want to start to have locally without using any network transparency protocol. Uh, this will be firstly based on SDL2, which does multi hat multi monitor already. Uh, this is all work Dave is doing. I'm just showing off Dave's work here, basically. And, uh, or not even showing, just talking about it. Um, that will be needed for multi -head. Uh The GPK port probably also will be extended with multi monitor support, but I don't know who will be working on that yet. Uh, and for network device like Spike and DNC, the render screen content can be read back from the host GPU, which is expensive and slow. We want to avoid that, but for remoting, at the moment, that's probably the first step. Later on, maybe we can do something smarter. And in fact, as a data step to the UI, so in this case, to pop up the Spice remote display component. And that will then uh, be sent on its way through the Spice client over the network. So there's a problem here, because for local VMs, we want to avoid the slow readback, right? You're, if you have your desktop, and on your desktop, you're running a virtual manager, and you have your local Bird manager viewer viewing your local uh, yeah you don't want to have to slow read back and all the copying of all the data of 30 or 60 frames a second. Uh, for the SPL and GTK UIs, avoiding the read back is easy because they're running in the same process. So you can just basically render directly to the screen. But uh, in process UIs are actually not what we use day to day. At least most people I assume are using Bird Manager or something like that, I hope. And if you're using Bird Manager, then you can have the UI running in the background. And you can open Bird Manager to view it and then close the viewer, but the UI will keep running or the VM. So Bird Manager does that by locally using a network transport like VMC or Spice. Uh, so if you're later, then you're no longer in the same process content. So uh, traditionally, this is done using Spice or VMC, but if we go to the 3D accelerated world and do the local rendering, we need to act, somehow expand this, that we're, even though we're doing a local host network or a local Unix client communication, we can still avoid the readback. Uh, well, libpurf comes to the rescue, more or less. At least it helps a lot, because libpurf already is smart enough for a local uh, connection to use Unix pipes instead of sockets. So we can pretty easily use file descriptor parsing because the connection is already a pipe, and over a pipe you can do file descriptor parsing. And we can use that to give uh, the viewer of a local VM, so the local Spice TTK client, for example, remote viewer or virtual viewer. Uh, actually, it needs to be virtual viewer and never doing it first. A handle to the renderer context, which is QMU is using to render it. And then uh, Spice TTK can use that renderer context to uh, do basically application side compositing again, it will take the texture which, or the disk type which is in GPU memory and tell the GPU to draw that on top of its window. So we're again we're seeing a situation where we're doing application side. So if you're doing this, if you're doing SSDMs, right, we're again we're seeing application side compositing showing up here. Uh, so this will hopefully be implemented in Spice uh, and be extracted away without that all the Spice 
say using uh, viewers will have this automatically work. Maybe we will need some API changes, or maybe we will need some small changes to uh, the clients. But that's all very, very far away. So what can we do, do we want to do in the future? Well, first of all, everything discussed so far is in the future. I have been putting a number from my head and they have not been contradicting it from like maybe a few years ago. <laughs> So uh, hopefully in three years we'll have this. We could already start working on some other improvements. Uh, look into better codex for sending more prints. Currently Spike is very much based on the concept of collecting a 2D drawing common stream and then uh, compressing little pick snaps like we have two more buttons and we have a special compression which is uh, optimized for a concept that all the two more buttons will sort of use the same pattern. So uh, that will no longer be relevant in this scenario. So we'll need better codecs for that. And we should also look into using hardware acceleration. Hardware acceleration can actually also help us avoid the expensive readback from the GPU, because almost all the GPUs nowadays use uh, or have hardware encoding on board. So we can use that. Uh, I know that strictly also for a number of reasons, but let's say we'll be able to use that. Then we can I can use a DMA buff, which is also what the file descriptor function before was about to pass around a context to the encoding thread. So, and that will ask the GPU to do encoding on the GPU, and we only need to read back the compressed context. So we'll be reading back a, an X264 stream, for example, or maybe a DPA stream, whatever we'll be doing for hardware encoding on the GPU. Which means that we're reading back a lot less data, so we're making the expensive feedback cheaper. But that's definitely something which, which uh, the SPICE team needs to look into in doing these kinds of things. So, well, as promised, there will be lots of room for discussion, and we still have about a quarter of our questions. Any questions about this? Um, I'm just curious. So, like, why do graphic cards have encoding capability in hardware? Because uh, doing encoding on the CPU is very expensive, and it drains your battery. And yeah, but so who does decoding? People do. I thought people do decoding, you know, play videos. But well, you need it for things like Skype. If you want to do Skype in a very uh, uh, efficient manner, then you will need hardware encoding. And more and more people are also doing transcoding, so they're, 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 they're ripping their DVDs and putting them on the PC. So it's just sort of a sudden point. One, one of the manufacturers started on the PC. But on phones, it makes a lot of sense, because if you want to do Skype on a phone, you really need it. And on the desktop, I think it started as sort of an extra selling point, so maybe I'm not sure who started it, maybe Nvidia started it and said, oh, we're going to do that too, or people are going to buy Nvidia cards because they're offering it, and then people started doing it too, so now they're all doing it. And it takes a lot of battery, and it makes encoding a lot quicker if you actually want to read DVDs or whatever. No more questions? I would have expected this to be like much more controversial. Calculate, I guess, it's 8 megabytes of frame, give or take. Probably 6 megabytes you can get away with 24 pixels, uh, bits of pixel. So, say 6 megabytes of frame, you should full HD times 30. So, that would be uh, 180 megabytes a second. Assuming no compression, so no, no loss. And with loss, I don't know how good loss was video codecs are. 
But I think what we want to do is we want to do a fixed bitrate encoding, so we use a lossy codec. But if you're in, say, Office, so you have a lot of text for a PDF viewer, then, of course, it's important to be almost lossless because text will look horrible if it gets MPEG-like encoding. But if you have a fixed bitrate and you have just a screen of text, then it will be almost lossless because there is no change, so the delta frames will be really small. And on the other hand, if you start playing page TV or playing a movie inside your VM, then there will be a lot of changes on the screen. So with a fixed bitrate, you will get more lossy compression. But I uh, hope that if we, we can find something, like say maybe 20 megabit a second, they say that 10 megabit a second is what you need to stream X2, X264 at 30 frames a second full HD. Uh, so if we, maybe we need 20 or 30 because we want to be more lossless. But again, I really see two different scenarios here. One is you're running Office, you have a lot of text on your screen or a view in the web page and it's static. So then if you pick a fixed bit rate for your encoding, we should get close to lossless. And on the other hand, if you have lots of moving stuff, yes, then it will become lossy if you pick a fixed bit rate. But at that moment, it shouldn't be that important that it's lossy. But it's something which we need to investigate and trial and error and whatever, and maybe someone will come actually up with a usable lossless codec. I doubt that. I seriously doubt that. But this codec being developed by Mozilla, a company called Java, and that's meant to be, it's still lossy, but it's lower friendly to the sort of things that have been indicated here. Quite when that will show up. So this is under, there's a number of engineers working on it. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any support for the VH differential encoding or encoding <coughs> differences? I have no clue. This is not my area of expertise. So this is what you can currently do. No, currently everything is lossless, basically. Uh, yes, well, what we try to do is we try to capture drawing comments from the, the guest, right? So the guest is saying, draw this rectangle and render this text here. But we try to just send those as drawing comments. So we don't really, we're moving now more to a dnc like module where we get an entire screen and then we will, we, you will have damage tracking, right? The guest driver will tell us these areas of the screen have changed. So we only need to resend those. So in that sense, it will already be differential. You see, um, question of the day. Do you see any hardware vendors doing stuff to make it easier for virtualization, for example, in the networking space? You've got SRI and card cards where you have one physical card which presents 1632 <laughs> virtual functions which you can give to one guest at a time. Is that going to happen? They, well, they have done it, but the proprietary and then also they run a big static partition on the trade card. Virtual VGA device in the slides. Do we have the um, specification for that device? No, we're inventing it as we go along. Or actually, Dave is inventing it as he goes along. So, um, where can I find some document and uh, stuff for that if I want to implement this device? And as I said, when it's finished, I'll have the talk. No. <laughs> I can't talk into something that doesn't work. <laughs> but the basic idea is it's a couple of VCs. We're still designing it. Uh, so that um, this device replaced the legacy VGA um, device before I implemented this virtual VGA device. Yeah, it's replaced the VGA. It's an all your device. Well, it's just another VGA GPU, so virtual GPU. 
Is sort of like almost a separate function of the device. You know, like I think uh, that hardware encoding may be a problem if we if we get a lot of guests, because probably the, the encoder can encode faster than real time. So maybe we can, we can if we like time slice it, we can do two or three or maybe even four streams on it. But at some point, we'll use the we'll encoder will just not be able to keep up with like ten guests on one host. Try to use the encoder for a first few reports, and then for the next one, you'll use the CPU, and then for another one, you will just tell me your story. You can't do this with more than high speed and so on. Or maybe we will need an adding card that we will just get a PCI Express card, which is actually a hardware encoding card. You already have the crystal card, which I think, so this is only a decoding, right? Or Not sure, but there are already separate hardware encoding cards. Uh, so maybe that will be a solution then, and we'll add one. We'll use the GPU for a few streams and that card for another few streams. And we're, we're inventing this as we go along, basically. So. I wonder whether you've got enough information from the guests to be able to help you do the encoding. I mean, you don't need to be motion to detect them if you know the way to get the difference about that. Yes. That could be useful to accelerate software encoding, but you would need to still do a lot of patches to your software encoding stack to actually use that information. And for hardware encoding, I think that's chanceless. I mean, if you look at the, the ATI model, as far as I know, you, you put a block with some firmware into the GPU, and it just does full encoding, and you're not in control. You feed it frames, and that's what you feed it. No, we're not in control there. So we have no way to actually pass that information to a level which could do something useful with it on the hardware encoding side. But it's an interesting concept, definitely. Any more questions? Or? You mentioned the guests are often running headless, and only when you bring the connection up do you need to render. By rendering only on the host, is there a consistency issue where you have to continue rendering? Yes, you, you will have to, if the guest does a readback, you will have to continue rendering on the host. Even when the guest is not shown. Yes. But actually, there is no consistency issue, whereas doing client rendering actually has to sustain with two different renderers. So if you do the readback from the client, you will get latency, but it will match what the user sees. And if you do the readback on the host, you'll get a different rendering. Because GL is not pixel access. So actually, by always doing all the rendering on the host, you do get a consistent result. It just means you keep burning GPU power if the guest does reset. But you can probably do smart stuff there, at least for VDI-like solutions, that you just suspend the guest if there has been a disconnection and there hasn't been a disconnection for a couple of minutes. Yeah, you also Yeah. Mm -hmm. The whole project of migration should work. 
I think we're out of time. I guess we can take one more question. So anyone has the final question? The answer is 42, of course. <laughs> so if there are no more questions, I want to thank you for your time. And I want to point out that there's a group photo now in the atrium outside. So <laughs>